This is the Average Guy Network, and you found Home Tech, show number 114, recorded on April 25th, 2013. Here at Home Tech, we cover all your favorite gadgets that find their way into your home. News, reviews, product updates, and conversation, all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Carlson, broadcasting live from the AverageGuy.tv studios here in just a beautiful top 10 day here in Bellevue, Nebraska. And of course, and of course we post the show each week with world-class show notes out at the AverageGuy.tv. If you have questions, comments, or contributions, you can contact the show. Always just send us an email podcast at TheAverageGuy.tv. You can find me on Twitter at Jay Collison or follow the show schedule on Twitter at TheAverageGuyTV. You can also join us for live chat during the show over at TheAverageGuy.tv live. So if you're watching on YouTube and you want to join us in the chat, there's some live chat right over right over there that you can just uh, use, uh, get into uh, live stream. You don't even need a, an account. You can just sign in with a alias and join us for chat. Many of you already have. We want to welcome those who have come out to chat with us as well. And I want you to know I improved the video. So hopefully you're seeing a little bit better video in live stream than you were seeing before. But in case you want to get the super detailed, right below us is actually a YouTube uh, window that's simulcasting this. If you get both going at the same time, you'll have two videos going on. But uh, So you want to pause one and have the other. But that's a little better resolution down below on YouTube. All right, we've got some, uh, we got some folks with us tonight. We're going to quickly go through those. Through and get the 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 guests and then get right to chat. It's been a while since I've had this many people on the show. It's been good. All right, let's go left to right, all the way to my left, and of course in in Melbourne, Australia. Andrew Morris plus one. Andrew, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, Jim. I think he's actually plus about half at the moment, given how big he's not. So all right. Um, well, <laughs> well, we might um, set a record for the youngest podcaster ever. So so welcome. Yeah, say something. Say something. Say goo. No. Nothing no, happened today. It's all right. Working well, with children and children and animals, you know what they say. Yeah, yeah, we're all good. And then, of course, to his right is uh, Christian Johnson. Christian, how are you? I am doing well, Jim. Awesome. Good to have you back. Are you are you basking in your glory of a week now? Of being five, days, five days. Five days. Uh, all right. Five yeah, days. Yeah, you left. you don't have much time left, so we'll talk nope. about that here at the end of the show. But sure. uh, welcome. And then all the way to the right, and uh, he joins us from time to time, Nathaniel Lindley. Uh, Nathaniel, how are you? Oh, you're muted. You came in muted. Sorry. That's all right. Rookie mistake. As I was saying, thank you for having me tonight. It's good to be here. Uh, it's good to have you. Thanks for coming out. We, uh, we want to dive right in. One of the things I'm trying to do is get right to the content and save the chit-chat for the end. So let's jump right in. We're here to talk about laptops. And uh, we did a series on network, uh, you know, home network configurations. And it was actually got real popular. I got really great reviews. And so for the next couple months, I'm going to try and pick topics if you'd like to suggest a topic for us to talk about and have the hosts come in and, and discuss. You can just send me an email, podcast at theaverageguy.tv. I'll take your suggestions, and we'll see what we can come up with. Over the next two or three shows, we're going to kind of talk about laptops, the good, the bad, the ugly, what you like about them, what you don't like about them. Uh, it'll all be from experience. We'll look ahead a little bit to some of the things that we're looking for. I'm sure we'll talk about both Windows and Mac. We're also going to talk about the Chromebook here in just a few minutes. And uh, we'll even probably discuss some Windows 8 and what, what things might be ahead in the future. So over the next couple shows, hopefully you'll be you'll joining us for, uh, for that conversation as, as we, uh, we get to talk about laptops. All right, let's dig right in. Nathaniel, in, uh, in Facebook, actually last night it started um, Katja over at the JPEG to Raw Facebook group. By the way, if you want to join the Average Guy Facebook group, you can head over to facebook.com slash group slash the Average Guy and uh, jump in that Facebook group. A lot of good tech conversation going on there. But one of the gals asked in that conversation, and hopefully she's out there listening right now. I invite her to come out to the, so, to the show. So, Katya, I hope you're, uh, Katya, I hope you're listening to that. Um, you had had a question. The question she originally had, she's looking at purchasing a Chromebook. And the ones she was looking at are those very inexpensive Samsung Chromebook. It's got the Wi-Fi and the 3G. It's got an 11.6-inch screen. They retail for about $250. Um, Nathaniel, I wanted you to talk a little bit about it because I think of all of us, you probably have the most experience. That's not the one necessarily that you have. Talk no. about the one you have, and then let's just talk a little bit about the Chrome OS. Right. So I'm uh, using, playing with, testing the 
not the original one, but the first Samsung model that came out, the 500 series, and it's either dark brown or white lid, and um, it's uh, it's their first generation. So this is about a little over a year old. I think it was about March last year that we got it, and um, it's pretty great, actually. It, I mean, if you know the limitations and you understand what it is and what it is not, it's a really good tool. It's fast, it's quick, and um, uh, reliable. The battery lasts all day long, and um, I like it quite a bit. So um, I, I don't use it for everyday stuff. I have this MacBook that I use, but um, my son uses this quite a bit for his schoolwork at home. And I love it because he can take it in the breakfast bar or at the kitchen table or downstairs or sit on the chair. It's real portable and uh, quick and easy for him. And he uses Google Apps for education at school. So he's logging into his work. He's creating presentations and documents and sharing them with teachers. And um, it's, a, it's a really good tool for that. Let's talk a little bit about the limitations, though. What, as you look, you know, certainly it, it can do web browsing and some of those things, but what are the limitations associated with it? Well, the big one is no Java. So you're not going to be able to put Java on here and run Minecraft to his disappointment. So if you're, if you're running Java-based web apps, then, you know, no right ahead. There may be some hacks or way to do it, but uh, it doesn't. Uh, it won't run Silverlight. And it does run a version of Flash, um, but I, I'm not sure if that's a good or bad thing. Uh, but that's that's the biggest one is no Java, and there's no um, you can't install non Chrome web apps really. Um, so that's that's good to know. The other thing that people are like, well, you have to always be online because it's a cloud internet based device and um, it helps a lot, but there is offline mode. So if you, if you sync your docs offline to the local storage, you can still edit and work on them uh, just as you would on the airplane. When you get back online, you send it up. So there is that, there's a card reader, there's a SD card reader on the front here and a USB port. So you could plug in extra storage if you needed it. Um, that's accessible and uh, it's pretty simple. So, so mainly though, I mean, there is, if you are not connected, there are some, and just like a regular laptop, I mean, there's mm -hmm. some limitations, right, associated with that. Um, did you get the 3G model or anything that had connectivity? No, no, this is Wi-Fi only. So when this came out, um, I want to say it was close to $500. And now there's uh, several models to choose from, including the very popular Samsung Series 3, which is the $250 model. Right, right. And fairly inexpensive. I've sold fairly well out yeah. there in the market. I, I don't know. I don't have access to any of the numbers, but I, I think those sold pretty well. You know, in the Facebook conversation, uh, we really started, or, or the conversation really was focused on, it out there now. I'm sorry, I'm probably not pronouncing your name right, but I apologize for that. Thanks for coming out and joining us. Um, the 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 real question was: Is her usage is going to be very very light? So some email. So it's going to be home. I'm going to say, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, she's going to be home probably 90 or 90 for percent, 95 percent of the time, on the road every once in a while. Uh, so she was looking at purchasing the 3G, which comes with 100 gig of data a, a month. I'm sorry, 100 meg of data a month, which is not very much data to be honest it's just it's not a lot when you think about that but then again she doesn't intend to be out there very long um, using that and you can shut that off when you're on the road and open it back up when you get within Wi-Fi so Nathaniel in that scenario some email browsing the web uh, maybe update some documents on the web those kinds of things and catch you if you can I don't know if you're in the Google infrastructure at all do you use Google Docs or do you you know are you in that environment maybe you can drop that in chat as well from what you know, Nathaniel, is that pretty much, is that going to work for her in that scenario? I mean, is she going to be able to use it just for that, those yeah. purposes? Yeah, totally. I wouldn't spend money on the 3G model. Um, really? So at work, as you know, I work in a school district. We have about 500 Chromebooks deployed. And we've got the Samsung 550 or the 500 model, which is this old one. Then the 550 was the next Samsung generation. That was about $400. And then we've got a lot of the $250 model, the Series 3 that she's looking at. We also bought some of the 3G enabled ones. And our goal was to use those with some students that needed devices that um, 
to uh, balance equity issues. And we thought this would be great to get 100 megs of 3G for free. So I tested one out. 100 megs is like two YouTube videos. Okay. It, it just doesn't last. It's like nothing. And so then to get more 3G, you've got to pay another account to Verizon. And it's pretty expensive, just like everything else. And when we were, we were working with the kids and getting them set up, they're all like, well, I have Wi-Fi at home or I go to the library or, you know, they don't see not having always on access with a laptop as a drawback. Okay. And so my experience with it is that 3G was really crappy and slow and it, you know, I really got not very much done with the 100 megs I was allotted. So I wouldn't choose to spend money on that. And especially if she knows the limitation ahead of time, that's what it is. And if you can use your phone or another device as a hotspot, that's probably more economical anyway. Christian, you've, um, you, you know, you're, you in your in your high school class there, you guys are fairly advanced as far as using some of that, you know, laptops and and uh, uh, tablets and stuff. Have you any Chromebooks in your ecosystem at all? No, our ecosystem has really changed. I mean, freshman, sophomore year, the majority of our devices were Windows, and now leaving Canisius, the majority are Mac. Um, all the teachers have MacBook Pros. All the students have um, iPad 3s that are connected to the network. Some are 4G enabled, so uh, they're getting kind of the unlimited data plan with 4G, which gives them a lot of flexibility at home. Um, so in that sense, everything is very uh, kind of mobile and um, I'd say more trendy in the sense that that is kind of what Mac gets its reputation for. Um, in, in terms of productivity, I mean, the students there are doing the same types of things on their iPads and are doing it just as successfully. I mean, a lot of almost every student has basically the the actual iPad, uh, the little fold-out keyboard that folds up and covers the case, and they just use them like mini laptops to type and take notes, and they can flick to all their games, And which is actually one of the big controversies at the school right now is um, the IT department doesn't do anything to enforce. I mean, because technically the students have bought and paid for these iPads themselves, so they don't... Um, enforce you know like you can't download games on your ipad and play them on your school so you'll you'll get people who have no self-control who are gaming in the back of the classroom on their ipad for the entire day straight um and then they find out the hard way um really but um in terms of people who are actually using it productively they can do all the same things that they could do with a fully functional laptop for for school purposes i mean they're checking emails they're looking up things on on the internet and they're they're writing word documents um and one of the big things we have is called e backpack which is essentially mm -hmm. just a digital uh digital backpack where teachers dump their files and you pick up your files and they have a nice iPad app for that that they use um, and of course actually believe it or not Moodle used to be all the rage at Canisius when we were using the Windows stuff but Moodle has since been phased out because everyone all the students and teachers alike have found um, e-backpack to be much uh, simpler to use and get things done with but in terms of uh, it's kind of the, it sounds like the same exact use case and really um, the the Chromebook without the 3G I mean I I'm really I had no idea about the hundred uh, megabyte per month cap on the 3G I think that's absurd that's like the equivalent of... well it's for free though they give you a hundred and that's they're they're giving you the 3G oh, okay service. and they okay. get yeah, it's free. They give you 100 okay. meg for free. You can buy, I think you can buy a service plan if you want to. Okay. And, and put yeah, more on there. But it's just a free, and they and they give you 12 free, um, uh, who's the, Go, go no, uh, Boy, Boygo, um, the one that provides Wi-Fi on the planes. Go, go in flight. Go, go in flight. They were one of those. Okay. They give you 12 free sessions on planes so that you can, you know, that you can use. So they're what they're trying to do, I mean, Google's just trying to be, uh, nice about saying, well, if you need to update your email and you're on the road, you do have a hundred meg for free on it. So let me let me be clear about that. Okay. Yeah. No, that makes and sense. I, and, I guess, and I guess a hundred meg when you're using a web-based service, as long as you're not streaming video, it's it's fairly significant. I mean, 
my my take on 100 100 meg is that if if you're not downloading YouTube videos, it's only ever really a text update. Yeah, although the average website, like if you pull up like CNN or something, you're downloading two megabytes every time you hit that page with all the dynamic stuff that's going on there, Yahoo and stuff alike. Um. <laughs> I, I, I guess it's, it's your usage. I guess it's your usage scenario, though, isn't it? Like if you're um, yeah, if you're using a Chromebook for you know its intended its intended road warrior purpose of you know sending a, send send receive emails and you know updates. Yeah spreadsheets and Google Docs, then you probably, I don't know, 100, 100 megs should last a bit longer. But I, I guess a, a question I would have is if you're running these things in a managed environment, like in a school a school environment or something like that, can you, can you prevent your kids from downloading YouTube videos and things like that via a, a Google policy? Yeah, well, that's, a, that's an interesting question, Andrew. Um, there is a control panel with the Google Apps for Education. And if you pay as an organization like a school, if you pay a $30 enrollment fee, which is a one-time fee for the device, you can do some management in the Google Apps control panel. Um, the amount of management you get for $30 is pretty slim, pretty weak, I think, compared to other management systems. But we can do things like prevent guest sign on. We can preload home pages. We can do a whitelist or a blacklist of apps and extensions. And we can have a custom domain Chrome web store. So we can make a our school web store and preload the apps that we want kids to have access to and use. Um, but it's pretty light. We don't get things like last IP or last logged on user. We don't get um, the ability to remote wipe devices. Uh, things like that, and uh, yeah, we it, the we YouTube piece would be a content filter problem, not a device filtering problem. Yeah, okay. But but if you, if you wanted to, you could you you could block YouTube video or as yeah. an entirety, like as a service, or not not yeah for the entire network, but not for just Chromebooks at this point. Uh, there's probably tools yeah, that could okay. do that, but not you can't tell the Chromebook to don't play YouTube. Yeah. Okay. Not down at the individual I guess, level. I, I I guess it's fairly fairly new in its in its iterations mm -hmm. too. So you you'd imagine that you know as the device gathers market market traction, then that's something they may they may increase. But you know I, I guess you know being a core Google product, they probably also want it, it used a lot as well. Yeah, well it's it's definitely young and growing, and I love that the price has dropped in half in a year, and the Series Three Chromebooks that are two hundred fifty are cheaper. I mean, they are not as fast, they're not as durable um, as the Samsung 550, which is really my favorite model right now. It's the second gen one. That one's fast, reliable, great trackpad. Um, and the, the Series 3, the newest one, is, is a compromise, but it's also 250 bucks. That's less than we pay for an LCD lamp. You know, in our projectors, we can get a Chromebook for less than an LCD lamp. And, well, and that uh, was their intent, right? I mean, they they wanted yep. to get those. They wanted to make them almost going back to that one laptop per child program, where we try to get those things down to a hundred bucks. Uh, yeah. you know, that was probably unrealistic. But two fifty is, uh, you know, really um, decreases that barrier to entry. Uh, Nathaniel, talk, you know. Um, so as we talk about this, you say it's slower. How much slower is the two hundred fifty dollar version versus the five hundred dollar version? Not not two hundred fifty dollars slower. Okay, <laughs> it's a it's a good machine. So this this five fifty is pretty good, and my son's using that. And um, if it lasts, I, I'll probably look at a Chromebook for my son when he goes into the middle school in sixth grade. Um, I I think it's a better device in a school system that uses Google app and another online course system. Ours happens to be Moodle. And if, if the teachers and the students are living in a web-based system that's platform agnostic, it's, it's a lot more productive device. It's very different from an iPad. An iPad is a great device. It's got really unique and powerful apps, but it doesn't have the same productivity typing functionality without the add-ons and things like that. And it's twice as much. Okay. So, um, we see a lot in our schools. We see full-blown laptops, Windows, Macs. We see iPads. We see Android tablets. Um, but we're starting to see a lot of Chromebooks coming in uh, that the kids own. They bring themselves as well as providing them um, in carts and, and clusters in the school. 
Okay. Um, Christian, let me ask you, uh, in that $250 range, if you had $250 to spend, would you buy anything different than the Chromebook? I mean, I remember some of the entry-level netbooks when netbooks first started becoming popular with the 10-inch screen. I know Acer made a $200. This this is going back to like the first gen um, Atom 280 processor with one gig of RAM. You could pick up for 200 bucks, and that was a, a a lot smaller of a screen. This one we're talking uh, basically a 12-inch screen. Uh, you're definitely getting more than your 1024 by 768, which on the netbook you're getting 1024 by 600. So it's definitely easier to read, and I'd say for the same uh, kind of weight to uh, portability ratio, it's in that same kind of category, I would say. And really, um, I mean, the advantage of the netbook is that you get that level of portability using, in most cases, a Windows operating system, which allows you to use your standard set of Windows programs and features, right? But, you know, if you're just doing your, your Google, your internet, your email, you're do it, you can get all that same functionality that you would be supposedly using this netbook for. And for arguably a better looking screen, um, maybe a, a better, more comfortable keyboard layout, um, obviously a quicker OS because you're not going to have all the kind of clutter that's going on with Windows. And like I said, if you're, if you're actually sure that you're just going to be using the Chromebook for those things, then I think it makes... Uh, a whole lot of sense to go that route. Um, it's it's kind of a trimmed down interface, so it's kind of hard to mess things up. And uh, I know there are a lot of hack uh, hack type projects out on the internet to make your Chromebook do all sorts of cool things. It's basically a glorified Linux OS, same thing as the Mac OS in reality. Um, so I I really don't see how you could go wrong uh, choosing it at that price range. Okay, Andrew. Any uh, your your RHP guy? Any thoughts on you know on if you if I gave you two hundred and fifty, would you go with the Chromebook or would you do something different? Uh, you you wouldn't get the HP Chromebook for two hundred and fifty bucks. I think it's about three hundred and fifty bucks. Yeah, three twenty nine. Um, yeah. Um. So that hit the market uh, a couple of weeks back. Um. That's a fourteen inch model. I'm yep. not entirely sure what the processor is, but um, look, the the netbook that I'm on at the moment cost me 368 bucks, and that's got a Core i3 2567 or 2467M processor in it, running a full operating system and a 640 gig hard drive. So, you know, I guess it's a it's a trade off between um, whether you want the full blown operating system or, you know, as as a parent, I could say where the Chromebook would be appealing because. You want to give your kids something that they can do their homework on and not play games. So, you yeah, know, in theory. Well, they still find a way to play so. games. There's games in the, oh, Chrome, yeah. in the Chrome store. I mean, there's, there's, yeah, there's but games. There's not Clash of Clans. Come on. <laughs> but, um, no. but it's going stop them playing Call of, Call of, Tour of Duty and Call, or Call of Duty, or whatever it's called. And, yeah, yeah. you know, the heavy lifting games that, that you, you're always hearing people complaining that all their kids ever do is sit in front of this damn game playing it and stuff like that. So I think there's a there's a degree of appeal there if you want your kids to be a little bit more focused and not as distracted by, by you know, the, the the full operating system experience and that's probably got a lot going for it in that aspect too. Let's talk uh, let's talk a little bit about security real quick uh, on something like this. Of course, because it's a, a Linux distro, basically just a glorified Linux distro and it doesn't suffer from some of the same security problems maybe that a Windows box does. Nathaniel, in your experience, does the, does it make them inherently more secure? Yeah, and a lot easier to manage. So from, from my IT point of view, a cart of 30 Chromebooks is almost um, zero effort, right? So we, we literally take them out of the box, slap a barcode on, scan the barcode into our inventory system to match a serial number and the PO and then put them back in the box and send them to the school. And the first person who logs in with a domain email account that enrolls the device in our control panel and that's it. We're done. And then it gets all the settings from there. So there's no imaging, there's no prepping, there's no drivers. I mean, it's so lightweight for us in it. And then if you start to have problems, 
you can do a, an in-place wipe where you flip a switch and do a keyboard command. It completely does an erase of the state and reapplies the OS from from on the device, and then it you just re-enroll it and it's back in. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't work, you can reload from a USB key um, per device. And if that doesn't work, you send it back. So troubleshooting wise, it's easy. Um, it, I mean, I, I can get them ready and into the hands of kids so much quicker than any other device. iPads are slower. Obviously laptops are slower. It's, it's just quick and easy on our part and the kids use it. So there's, there's several classrooms where they got a set of 30 and they're just on them all day and they don't care which one they have. Cause it doesn't matter. They log into it. They got all their stuff. They log out. The next kid takes it. It becomes no theirs, like right? That. Yeah. And but it, the, when you say but, they have a domain account, are those Gmail yeah. accounts or are yeah, those... those are Google apps for education accounts? Okay. So their mail, their docs, their presentations, their calendars, you know, it's all their stuff's there, but it doesn't matter what device they use. On the iPad, if you're trying to share an iPad, you can't because there's no accounts. There's just one account. And so that's that's been really frustrating to have shared iPads. They're not meant to do that. Um, so wow. from that perspective, we, we like them quite a bit. And we've had about 500 in our ecosystem, and I think we've sent back 5 to 10 for repair, some of them in warranty, some out. Um, but, you know, it's just easy. And for 250 bucks, it's great. Yeah. So we have a, yeah. we have a teacher who's um, sixth grade, middle school, language arts. He does not have a classroom. He literally has a cart of 30 Chromebooks and he just tells the kids where they're going to meet in the school for each hour. And they just work wherever they land. And he just loves it. He said, I don't think I could go back to having a classroom. So that's a really different model for us. It's really uh, changing things. Well, and, and Katja is saying in chat, she is on Google Calendar and has both personal and business Gmail. I think if you're in the Google ecosystem, this is <laughs> just kind of a match made in heaven, right? I mean, everything just shows up for you when you log in, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it loads your extensions. So when I log in with my work account, I get extensions and bookmarks that load that are unique to my work account my work Google account. And if I log out and log in with my personal Gmail account, I get different extensions and different bookmarks. So it's really nice that way. Um, there was a question in chat. I think it was Lopta said, you know, there's a remote control, there's Chrome remote control, right? That's, that's built in now as one of the apps. Uh, will that work on a Chromebook? Can I, can I both remote control from another location or a Chromebook? And can I use a Chromebook to remote control a PC that, that has that software installed. Have you used that? Are you familiar with it? Yeah, I have. I've tried it once and I can't recall if I've used it to go using a Chromebook to remote control my mm -hmm. Windows desktop. I so have it's seen videos for that happening. So you it have? is that direction. Okay. I, you know, I tested it out and then I was like, okay. And then I left it because I don't have that use case right now. But um, yeah, there's, there's a lot coming out with the apps and that yeah. stuff. So I know if, there's if a company that. that's out there that's doing it right now. And then there's a lot of um, VDI type apps where you pay for virtual desktops in your infrastructure and you remote in from the Chromebook. So uh, they're trying to sell that a lot where you've got um, uh, VDI is the VMware. I, don't, I can't remember what the others would be, but you remote into a full desktop. And you say eight hours on the battery. Yeah. So that cart in the class, Room, they just plug it in at night. They right. don't have to take the cords out. You know, uh, it, it's simple because we're a Google Apps for Education school. We use Moodle, and we're transitioning teachers and kids to doing more online digitally anytime, anywhere. So now, it's a good tool for this purpose. What are you using for Moodle that you don't get in things like eBackpack? Well, Moodle's not really a file repository very much. So, um, and so there's, there's stuff that teachers post in their courses, like PDFs and videos and embed links and things, but it's not eBackpack. I think of more as like a Dropbox where um, it's sort of a Dropbox for teams or a managed Dropbox, if, if I'm understanding correctly. And, and that's a paid service. So um, we don't pay for it. Mm -hmm. is, am I right that that's more like a Dropbox? Yeah, I mean, it really is, but uh, whenever, I mean, I remember the days when all we used was Moodle before eBackpack and the iPads, and it was like all the teachers really did was they'd have their page, 
maybe like a course calendar, which was a Google calendar anyway that you could connect through anything, and they just embedded it in the Moodle page. Yeah. And then it was really just a drop-down list of their Word docs and their PDFs that they wanted students to get. And, you know, they never really used, like, the form features or anything like that. So really, um, I never saw any teachers use it for anything more than a glorified Dropbox. I think the only case I've actually seen it be used partially productively. I mean, I know it has like uh, like a grade book and all that kind of stuff, but um, our school uses uh, a service called Blackboard, which is another paid service, so their grading is also being outsourced. And um, the only thing I ever saw, I had one teacher that ever used it, was uh, the online quizzing, where you could do take multiple choice quizzes and that kind of stuff. But um, it, all in all, it just really kind of fell by the wayside in our school. Well, that's too bad because I think Moodle is really powerful and we do use it for more than just a course calendar and a list of syllabus and a bunch of PDFs. So um, there's a varying degree depending on the teacher's skill and comfortability, but it is more powerful than that. It, it, a lot of the quizzing and the chat room features and discussions. And, and one of the things that uh, I hear from teachers, they like, uh, they can embed videos and things like that, but as kids use it, they can see the kids took nine seconds to take that 30 question quiz or they, right. took, they watched half of the video and then took the quiz and they failed it. Well, they look back at the data and say, well, you failed this because you didn't watch the video. Oh, you can tell. Yeah. So it, it's Oops. like any tool. It depends how you use it. And um, we're, we like it. You know, we're going to be transitioning to uh, version 2.2 or whatever next year. And um, it's become a real uh, addition to the classroom. So some of the work takes place out of the classroom and research. So when they get into the classroom and the kids are face to face with each other and the teacher, they can capitalize on that time to have discussions and things that you can't do online. Okay. Interesting. We kind of call it blended learning or, you know, hybrid. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things, uh, back to the Chromebook here for a second, mm -hmm. one of the things that I, I picked up from my trip to Germany. Now, I, I, I realized I was listening back to the podcast I did right after I got back, and I was a little hard on Europe. So let me just, if you're, you're listening to the show and you're, you live in Germany, I was a little hard on you guys when it came to the Wi-Fi access, but uh, both in Paris and in Frankfurt, I just didn't have a lot of Wi-Fi access. Free Wi-Fi, let's, let's, let's qualify that, a lot of open free Wi-Fi you know, in the United States, we're moving that direction where you can go anywhere with the exception of maybe Waffle House and get free Wi-Fi from just about any restaurant. You know, I was in Burger King the other day and my phone popped up. Hey, Wi-Fi hotspot, you know, type deal. Um, they're really trying to get uh, uh, people to come into the restaurants and stay right in the restaurants and use the Wi-Fi. I would think a Chromebook in the U.S. under the circumstances that we're moving in now is even more powerful uh, from the from the sense of, not needing 3G because you can get it at any Starbucks or any, just about any restaurant it seems like is offering free Wi-Fi. Maybe not so much in Europe. So I'd love to hear from you guys, uh, maybe our UK and, and our folks in Australia um, and, and Andrew, maybe when Andrew steps back in, we'll ask him if, how's the, how's the, oh, there he is. Andrew, how's the free Wi-Fi in Australia? Do you, are you guys moving the direction we are where it's available almost everywhere now? Yeah, look, it's getting better. It's, um, I think in the next couple of years, we'll probably start seeing a bit more of the WiMAX services become available as well. So a lot of the, utili the utility companies are starting to, um, to implement WiMAX networks, and I think a lot of the telcos are probably sort of starting to think about it as well because there's a lot of good strategy in them, in them doing that. Probably more so in the in the central business districts of the major cities that will be the initial stage. But we've got to also got a, um, a national broadband network that's um, probably in the process of starting to deploy um, in anger in probably the next year or so. So I think there was a wireless component in that as well as the you know the the hundred megabit to to the house as well across the country. So. Um, you know, there's, there's definitely going to be some stuff happening, but at the moment, it's probably more your McDonald's and your, your Hungry Jacks, um, which is Burger King for you guys, and, you know, your, your coffee shops and that. But even then, a lot of those, you log into them and there's a, like a passport or a pay type system. 
So there's not a, there's not a lot of free, but it's, it is starting to appear. Okay. Well, that's good to know. As I was, as we got an international crowd, it appears out there in chat. I don't know really where everybody's from, but uh, from that standpoint, it, it was you know my experience in Germany. We just it was hard to find the free Wi-Fi, so maybe not as. But but go all the way back to the very beginning of this discussion, then we'll put a wrap on the Chromebook. Um, if you're at home, at least for me, I'm at home x number of hours during the day. I have free Wi-Fi at my house. I am at work, uh, let's just say, you know, I maybe, let's just say I'm at home 30% of my day. I'm at work the other um, 65% of the day. Then I'm, you know, I'm, uh, that the other 5%, I'm in my car or I'm just, I happen to be somewhere else. I, I think if, so catch, I think if you're going to use that at home and maybe places that have free Wi-Fi, I think you're going to be fine. Right. I mean, I think that's what we're saying here is that that's probably a good purchase for you for the price for what you're going to use it for. So we'll wrap, we'll wrap it. Any other thoughts on the, on the Chromebook? I agree. Okay. Very cool. Well, you get that right here. Uh, Katya, thanks for uh, actually jumping in our group and mentioning that. I thought it's ironic. We did not plan. Uh, well, well, we had planned this laptop discussion a week and a half ago. And, uh, and I just thought it was uh, really, really helpful to come in and talk about that and, and kind of go over that. Um, now, here's something we also don't talk a lot about. Nathaniel, you're going to uh, be a little bit of a lightning rod on this one maybe for us, is that we don't mention Macs a lot. On We're, we're kind of a Windows-centric in what we do, but, you know, more and more, I'm, you know, of course, more and more folks are getting Macs. Talk a little bit about your Mac experience. Tell me what you got and kind of talk through that. Well, I, I've gone back and forth between Mac and Windows for years and years, so I've used both a lot. Um, I have a, a MacBook, a 2007 MacBook Core 2 Duo, which is one of the uh, black MacBooks that you could get, um, which is a little bit unique, and I bought it used from someone for 400 bucks. So it's five, six years old, um, almost six years old, and I've been very happy with it. Um, I put in an SSD and it's got four gigs of RAM. Then I maxed it out and it's just fine for what I'm using it for, which is what I would need more than a Chromebook. So it's the next step up. It's it battery's not so great. It heats up. The processor is a little slow with flash, but otherwise I can do all my browsing. I can RDP, you know, um, I have a few local apps that I run, but pretty much it's um, browsers and remote desktop and terminal. So it, it's a really good tool for me. At, at home, I have a Mac and Windows, and I just go back and forth quite a bit. But I don't, in terms of laptops and the discussion of laptops, I don't think I would choose to spend money on a high-end laptop. Uh, I would never get a 17-inch behemoth. If I'm going to get another laptop when this dies, I'm going to get a thin, cheap, you know, I'd, I'd probably go with a 13-inch screen. I don't think I could handle 11-inch, but I'm going to get a thin, cheap laptop that I take with me um, when I'm not at a desktop. Yeah, let me let me just share a story because I think it, it ties right into what you're talking about. At work, um, oh, I don't know, three months ago, they said, oh, hey, the laptop you have is going off lease. We want to give you another one. It's going to be temporary because you're going to, we're going to get new ones in the fall. And so we're going to switch you from this Dell to this Dell. And so they're like, you want to, uh, like a big screen Core i7 or do you want kind of the smaller like Core i5? And I thought, mm -hmm. well, big screen Core i7, who could go wrong, <laughs> right? With that, I mean, lots of real estate. Well, then I realized at work, I'm one of these guys that I don't ever shut the lid of my laptop at work because it, I, I need it quickly to open back up in a spinning drive in a laptop. Just That just doesn't work for the most part. SSD has kind of fixed that, but we're still using spinners. And so I just never shut the lid. I carry my laptop around. I've mentioned this on the show. I carry it around like a tray of food, right? I'm moving around. I'm carrying it. People said, oh, you're going to crash it now. It never lost a hard drive doing the fact that I banged it into the wall one time and it was still okay. But, um, and so, but I realized as much as I carry that thing around the building, I carry it to every meeting and every place I go, man, that core I seven big screen was heavy. I mean, it just got, it was a workout just carrying it around. Recently, it had some problems, and so I, tr I went back. I traded it back in for a smaller 15-inch Core i5, and I've, 
I picked that up just two days ago and I, man, every time I pick it up, I'm like, Oh, thank you. I, you know, it was just one of those things that it was for me, it was just better to go smaller uh, for, for what I'm doing. So I, I kind of hear you saying the same thing with that. Yeah. I mean, I'm not out in the field shooting video or shooting pictures where I need a big workhorse and I'm willing to take the weight. I don't, I don't need that. I need light, quick, portable, you know, lightweight in my backpack. Yeah. And preferably an SSD. We've talked about that. Oh on, yeah. On the no, show. I, I, I don't think I'd use a spinner in a, a laptop anymore. And you know, I know that it's fast and it's reliable for me, but if it crashed, I know I'd lose everything. So, you know, mine's got, not a whole lot of data. It's always backed up, of course, and it's using File Vault 2, which is their whole disk encryption. So, you know, even if I left it behind, I don't have anything to worry about. And it, since I bought it used, it's not like I put a big investment into, you know, a $1,500 MacBook Air or something like that. Right. right. And that's the other expense. They get pretty expensive. Christian, you'd mentioned last week, two weeks ago, I can't remember when we were talking about, I think it was last week, we were talking about school. And by the way, if you haven't, if, if somehow we've gotten back on education topics, which is dynamite, we seem to be an education podcast over the last couple of weeks. Christian dove in. Was that last week, Christian? Was that just last week we talked about that? See, there were one or two, two weeks ago. Okay. So two weeks ago, we, we, Christian, of course, got accepted into Maryland, University of Maryland College Park. Big, long podcast. We're still not done with it. We still got some stuff to do. But if you're interested in that education topic, maybe you're coming to listen to the show for the first time head back to show 112. So if you go to the average guy.tv slash HT for home tech 112, get back to that. And Christian does a nice job of talking about his admission process into uh, what we call our college system here in the United States, which is pretty interesting. And of course you were going into a competitive space, but Christian, you mentioned to me at some point in time, a, a new laptop is in order for you quite possibly as you're thinking about school. Um, are you, you, are you in a, in a situation where you're going to, going to change out? Are you buying something going into the fall here? Yeah. So for the fall, I'm actually going to swap. My sister's going to Spain. So, um, I'm going to steal her laptop that she normally uses for college, which is a pretty high powered Dell, um, Inspiron that has a beautiful, um, it's one of the few laptops they made where it has the 15 inch screen but it has the 1920 by 1080 panel and it's just beautiful. Um, really it does everything I needed to do, but so I'm just going to use that for the fall and probably put uh, an external monitor in my dorm to hook it up to. Um, but after fall, so probably spring my freshman year, uh, I'm really hooked right now on the Lenovo ThinkPad Helix that they just started shipping. And it's this gorgeous high powered, um, basically all in all in one deal where it's 11.6 inches it uh, snaps into a laptop in a little clamshell you pop it out you got a Windows 8 uh, uh, tablet it's a 12 inch uh, screen it's got a IPS panel so the resolution and the the picture quality is gorgeous it has special cooling design for high powered performance so it's not like you're getting like a tablet that only has like so much power you can use it just like a fully powered laptop or desktop it uses the third generation Intel i7 processor uh, you can get up to a 256 gigabyte SSD in it with 8 gigs of DDR3 RAM um, and it just the form factor and the sleek factor and the functionality factor is is amazing really um, and it also has this awesome uh, USB 3.0 dock that I would use for so the ideal thing would be like um, I either have it in the clamshell in the laptop form or I take it out as, as a tablet when I go to class right and then I come back to the dorm room and I have my two 24 inch monitors and there's a special helix dock that is used for the uh, for the ThinkPad that lets you hook it up to the actual uh, sync unit and plug in both of your 24 inch monitors to power them. So you get pretty much desktop, laptop, tablet, um, all in one. Uh, and it's of course on the pricey side, you'd probably be spending around 1800 to $2,000 for all of that, but uh, it's a, it's a good investment. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, it's it really though becomes a kind of a portable workstation for you at that point, right? right? And, and if you, yeah, but I mean, if you go and watch some of the videos on how it's designed and the engineering behind it, you'll just see it's it's really you're you're paying for the the quality of the unit. So it would be yeah. kind of the ideal, you know, if you want a desktop, laptop, and tablet all in one, it's like kind of the coolest way to go. Yeah. Nathaniel, that kind of goes against your what you just said about light and and what what do you think about that? Well, but in his use case, so think about that. He's got one machine to choose. He can't say I'm going to have a desktop and a laptop, and he wants some portable tablet functionality as well as a full keyboard. That might be worth the investment of seventeen hundred to two thousand dollars because it has that flexibility. And so, in in a college situation, you don't have the luxury of having a desktop with two monitors and a cheap laptop to take, and a phone and a Chromebook. You know, so that might be. I I don't know. I mean, it sounds like a really good use case, and he's thought out what he needs to do with the tool, and it makes sense to me. I mean, instead of buying, say, a thirteen hundred dollar desktop and a seven hundred dollar laptop, he's getting both in one. Is that how you see it, Christian? Yeah. No, that's kind of the, the whole Score. idea behind it because, uh, <laughs> you know, it would be one, one thing to, you know, drag the desktop I have here down there, but then it's like you, with the security of the dorm and stuff, like you just, it's yeah, yeah way more reason. risk than it's worth. So you're just going to leave it running at home or is Gary going to consume it into the, uh, into the basement <laughs> server? You know, area. my bedroom will probably become his personal den. So <laughs> that just means I'm going to, uh, leave it uh, i mean i'll leave it we have a, i'll just set it up for lights out so that which is already what i do now at school is i if i want to do something particular to how i have my desktop set up i just click on lights out and open up a remote desktop session to it so okay yeah it would make a nice I have a question oh, christian have you used lenovo's laptops before has anybody used lenovo's before um, i personally don't own any lenovo's in the house i've used them before um the the quality is I mean, it depends on what line you're going with, but I mean, the the actual quality of the hardware and the ThinkPad Helix is just, it's dynamite. Um, and you can watch, they posted an engineering video that kind of breaks down all the different things they did to make it work the way it did. And it's just, there's nothing that you can say, this is a bad thing about it. It's just, I literally could not find a single thing to critique about it besides the price, which you're paying for what you're getting. So... Yeah, I've I've had good experience with Lenovo's and I've liked their build quality. If you go with the ThinkPad line and things like yeah. that, so I have to agree with you compared to some of the HPs I've worked with in Dell. Oh yeah, I mean yeah, I would definitely say like your Acer and your HPs are not like that high grade um, OEM type hardware build. Whereas once you get up into Lenovo and some of your Dells, I mean for example, if you get an Alien Alienware brand laptop, it's it's you could throw it, you could throw it against a wall, and it would work fine. And it's a powerhouse, obviously. Um, so I think Dell is kind of the in between. But I, I really, Lenovo has has really made a lot of um, stepping stones since uh, you know the past few years. And I think part of that is, um, I believe, the reason why they own the ThinkPad copyright is because um, IBM folded in all their um, assets into Lenovo when they went out of the PC business. So I think um, maybe kind of the idea behind what IBM was trying to achieve with their business-oriented model combined with kind of the consumer thing that HP and everyone else was doing when Lenovo acquired them is probably now in the long term just starting to show some of the benefits of having that sophistication all in one. So here's a piece of Lenovo. We we have some uh, use for uh, the tablet PCs, like an actual laptop that flips the lid and it becomes a tablet. Right. And we've used the HP Elite Book line for a while, and they're pretty good. They they seem bulky for the small screen size. So we're just starting to look at the Lenovo Twist, which is an ultrabook with that flip and swivel lid, and it's a really great tool especially in our math and science classes where the teachers are diagramming right on the screen and they're using it like a tablet, but then they can flip it back and take it and use it as their main workstation too. Yeah. And that twist is a nice build too. It's very thin, um, and it, but it's got some weight and heft to it and it feels like it's built real well. 
and let me say, let me do a little future promo. In three weeks, we'll have Mike Howard on. He's actually got the yoga right now. And uh, he just picked that up. And, and Mike Martis, too. I should probably get Mike uh, on. Mike had a yoga out of the shoot um, and, and has been working with those. And, again, that's one of those foldable, flip it back, you know, it goes from laptop to a tablet, which is the form factor I really like. I, I think that's the direction I'd want to go with, with the next, you know, f with my next laptop purchase if I was going to do that would be in that direction. So let me tease you a little bit. Mike Howard's coming on again three weeks, and we're going to talk a little bit about the yoga um, from that standpoint, Andrew, any thoughts on uh, on these th or the, the things that we've been talking about here? And if you're looking, what are you looking for? Um, yeah, look, I guess I mean I've got a, a bit of an HP bias, of course, given the pricing that I get, which is pretty attractive. Um, I think there's a, there's a there's a big delineation in the the consumer grade quality versus the enterprise grade quality as well. So some of the enterprise stuff. That I'm seeing coming through the shoot at the down the shoot at the moment, like the um, the Touch Smart stuff, and that's that's pitched to the corporate market and the Elite Pad 900, and you know stuff like that. It's a totally totally different kit grade of hardware as well. Um, I see some of the Lenovo stuff. Um, Michelle's got a Lenovo ThinkPad something or other that she's got for for her work at the moment, and it's. To, to me, the ThinkPad stuff hasn't really progressed since uh, probably the late 90s, early early thousands. Like it's still very much the same look, the feel. You know, the only thing they've really done for mine is they've iterated they've iterated the hardware to be current, but the look and the feel is still the same, which is an appeal to me for the Lenovo stuff. Um, Dell, we we used to see a lot of Dell because when I was with EDS, we were a Dell partner, um, and their gear was very plasticky. Um, I've still got a couple of Dell machines floating around at home, but um, you know, if you if you walked them into a wall, you'd probably be picking up the pieces for those older the older ones. Um, but you know, my 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 current um, HP notebook, I've got an Elite Book 8460P, which has got a metal casing on it. Um, you know, the lid. I have had to have a screen replaced in one of them. That takes a, a, a certified tech about 35 minutes just to get the lid apart to replace the screen. So you know the build quality. I think it's. I think all hardware. It's pretty much what you you get what you pay for. I think if you go for you know a, a consumer grade piece piece of hardware, then you you get the consumer grade experience. You know if you if you're paying under six. Six seven hundred dollars. I think once you hit the, you know, the twelve thirteen hundred dollar mark, particularly in Australia, the, the build quality improves across the board, um, irrespective of the vendor. Um, yeah, me personally, if I was replacing anything at the moment, um, I don't know where I'd go. Um, you well, know, some some of the it's some some of the new touchpad stuff coming down is kind of nice. You know, if because you, if I think you you got to reconcile your fact to the, yourself to the fact that you're going to be on Windows 8 these days. Um, but you know, I think they're all, they're all much of a muchness now. I think the only thing that really varies greatly is the, the the physical form factor and how much you pay for it. Um, you know, in I mean, and let's face it, under the hood, you know, what can they really change anymore unless well, you're buying a Mac let me ask that a PC. let me ask that question because th that is we look to the future and you know we'll have a group of guys a different group of guys next week as we talk about this so uh, we'll get it out of the two of you now and Nathaniel and then next week you won't have to talk about this but um, what is next uh, Christian you mentioned as you're looking at this device uh, that you're looking for in the future this is gives you the ability to kind of snap out the the screen and take it with you, and it's a hybrid tablet slash laptop. Is that really all that different, or just a variation of a laptop? Where are we going in this space, and is the laptop going to go the way of the the desktop? Which is, I'm not saying the desktop's going away anytime soon, but certainly its numbers are dwindling down to enthusiasts. I would say. In the future, is the laptop going to go the same direction? Do you guys see that in the future, or um, is there a, a little bit longer of life left on that? Christian, I'll start with you. 
Yeah, I think there'll always be a need for the keyboard. I don't think everything's going to become touch just because we still, uh, in society, rely a lot on um, vocalizing ideas through the written word. So I think in some regards, people are still much more comfortable having something physical they can touch. Um, the one thing I could see that would change the game entirely, which is a little ways off, and by a little ways, I mean it's a ways off yet, would be ideally if you have a tablet where y you have your webcam on, 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 your, on the top part and on the bottom part is projecting a, uh, a keyboard on your desk and your, your touch is being picked up through a transmitter inside the, the tablet. That would change the laptop game because I think if people got over that physical feeling and was just typing the same way right on a physical desk, they could just put that tablet anywhere, plop it down, and the keyboard would come with them. So it would be um, you wouldn't have you know the weight of the keyboard, which would make the unit lighter, and you would still be able to do those things. So I think until that type of technology uh, comes out and matures, there will be a, kind of a strong need for a laptop. And then if that technology does come out and is successful, I think you'll start to see people will have trouble distinguishing between what is a laptop and what is, you know, a tablet that, you know, projects the, the keyboard on whatever surface you're using. And that's when you really get into, um, I think, is when the touch world starts to make sense is that, you know, right now, the way we do touch is we're actually touching the physical screen with the keyboard and that keyboard on the touch screen is taking up real estate. Um, whereas if you have the entire screen available to, you know, move around windows with your fingers and zoom in and do whatever, and your keyboard is also available as a, you know, kind of touch based interface that's being virtualized, the, and it's not taking up that space, I think people would totally gravitate towards that over the laptop model. Nathaniel, let me ask you, because you, you've got these kids using these devices, all everything we talked about, you know, we talked about an iPad, so let's, you know, how it's not as manageable as the Chromebooks. Uh, so let's put that aside for a second. In your experience from what you've seen, does it keep, at the education level, keyboard make a difference for the kids? Can the kids really be productive on an iPad? I mean, without a keyboard? Um, yeah, so we were just talking with some high school students today and we asked some things like, well, you know, we're doing BYOD. Do you like having the choice of finding the device that's right for you? Or do you think it'd be easier if we all had MacBooks or laptops or Chromebooks or, and the kids said, you know what? We really like choice. We like to find the device that fits us. I like using an iPad. I like using a Chromebook. I, and I've seen kids lugging around 17-inch Dells, you know, so they really choose what they want with, with their thing. And it's even individuals like, I like to use Word to take notes or I like to use Evernote to take notes and I do it this way. And so by the time they get in 10th, 11th grade, they've been taught the strategies to take notes and here's one way to take notes and here's another way. And they kind of find their way to make themselves productive. And so... Yeah, I've seen kids that can type like nobody's business on an iPad. And remember, we're putting our adult assumptions on how useful a touchscreen keyboard is. You know, I can't, I'm not the kid that can text on a nine keypad phone in my pocket, but we have kids that can do that. And so our assumptions of what works and doesn't work is not always accurate to what um, students are doing today. So some of them are just fine with a, a tablet or, um, an iPad and they'll bring a kick out keyboard or something and others prefer a full keyboard laptop. Um, I still think, you know, from my perspective, it's better to have a real keyboard, a physical keyboard. I don't think I could get adjusted to a projected laser keyboard, but maybe I could, I don't know, but they really want that choice and that individual um, ability to adapt for themselves. Yeah. Christian, you're in the middle of it. What's your, what's your, what are you seeing the students around you? Are, are, are they gravitating, gravita, gravitating, are they gravitating to that same philosophy? Yeah. Um, I think in our school, at least it's a bit different because I feel, well, I, it was kind of mandated that all seniors were the only ones that had the option 
um, because it was the first year they rolled out the program. We were the only ones that even had the option to opt out of the iPad program. All the other students were required to purchase an iPad. So it was just kind of like the set done deal type thing. Mm -hmm. And then they have, you know, a help desk where students can go every day to the help desk if their iPad is doing strange things or whatever. Um, and I, you know, I think just by saying this is what it is, this is what, this is what you have to get, um, students didn't seem to be as uncomfortable with it as I thought some of them might have been. Um, and I haven't heard anyone throughout the year saying like, oh, I hate having the iPad. It doesn't do anything for me. I've heard a lot of students say they thought, you know, a lot of seniors who opted out and or who have them and realize they've just wasted a ton of time on it, you know, say it would have been a lot more helpful if the school had just mandated we all get netbooks or you know we all get something that's the same form factor but is actually designed for work because um, like I said I, I think gaming and controlling and you know deciding whether or not you want to set up the units to be dummy proof when they're technically being purchased by the students or whether or not um, the school thinks it's in the best interest for the students to learn the consequences of not knowing how to manage their time. I don't think anyone ever really answered, to be honest. I mean, the way it is right now, they're completely unmanaged, but um, within reason. I mean, they, they can still get statistics from, I think they call it self-service. I don't know what type of iPad program they are to do that with, but... Um, you that's know, the Casper and, management system. Yeah, that's that's what they're using. But, you know, they don't enforce like, oh, this kid's playing Clash of Clans in math. You know, we turn off the iPad. So, um, Andrew, you and I are both in the enterprise uh, significantly. We're in the traditional enterprise model, mm -hmm. so to speak. How many of, in your shop there where, where you go in, how many laptops versus uh, desktops are there? Are you? Is it more laptops, more desktops? What are you seeing? Yeah, in in my immediate office, it's probably 90 to 95 percent laptop. Um, we're starting to see a little bit of bring your own device, but um, one of the pushbacks in both our own space and the customer space with BYOD is is security. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, at, when, as soon as you get into the enterprise. And unless you're bringing Max in, so I think unless you're bringing Max as a BYOD device, I think you, um, I think the security implication to any large organization is terrific. Yeah, you know, my laptop, I mentioned earlier, my laptop went down, you know, and I, I swapped it for a smaller one. And uh, and I, I, I thought to myself a little experiment. I thought, you know, and I had the HP DM1Z, which is my own, you know, it's the one I purchased a couple of years ago. We yeah, talk yeah. about it on the show all the time. It's a great little, great little uh, netbook um, that now is running Windows 8 because that's what I upgraded it to. It has an SSD in it, so that's, you know, it, it's super fast for a AMD A350, I think what it is. Man, it is yeah, lightning. It's yeah, it's lightning quick on boot up and shutdown, and it runs runs Windows 8 great. So, for a little, I think I paid two ninety nine or maybe three ninety nine. I can't remember yeah, back. Thereabouts. It was not terribly expensive, and the the SSD upgrade has made a huge difference. But I thought, can I work in my enterprise on you this? That. That's not that's BYOD. Uh, yeah, BYOD, right? And yeah. I could do everything except print. Right, that was the. I could get to my email through our web client. I could, or connect to it in Windows 8 through the mail client. I could get to all the websites. I could even, through uh, through our VPN, I could even get access to our our uh, um, accounting page, and I could do my timesheet, and I could do everything. And then I, I needed to print something. I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, it was weird how I got stopped by printing. You know, on that, so you can't. You, 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 so, so you couldn't create a direct connection to a printer. I could not. We're not set up for that. No, no. That's about the only uh, thing we can't do directly through yeah, our I've, through Because I've, I've been, I've been in the same the same conundrum. So I've taken the DM1 in because I've got mine as well, and um, I can do pretty much everything that you just described. But I can also print because I can make a direct IP connection to a printer. Well, you know, that's I mean, maybe I wouldn't try hard enough. I didn't try and set. Well, I'm not on the network. I guess if I beat VPN in, no, I'd have to think about it. I, they don't want you yeah. to do that anyway. They want printing <laughs> accounting. They want to know who's printing yeah, what exactly. where. So, 
Yeah, no, but it's just interesting. That would be the only thing that would really stop me from a complete, and I'll be honest with you, I don't print very much. I might, yeah. I might print a resume when I'm going into an interview with somebody coming in the office and then I shred those right after I'm done or I scan them in. If I make notes, I'll scan them in and add them to a file. So you're a real tree killer there, Jim. I try not to print. Yeah, I try not to. But it's just, you know, it's, it's for some reason when you're in an interview, it's okay to take notes on a piece of paper, but it's rude to type when they're talking. Mm -hmm. um, or at least that's the appearance. So I am not quite, so I still like to take notes on paper when I'm in an interview. That's maybe that's a cultural thing, or maybe that's me just being old. Uh, speaking of the printing, yeah, the Chromebook, oh, you yeah. can print through the Google cloud print thing. And we set that up once as a proof of concept and realize it's a huge pain in the butt. It, you have to open up Google talk protocol and it goes up to the cloud and back down and it's no accounting and, it's not so we just kind of said up oh, we don't print from chromebooks and it's okay. all in the cloud anyway so right just a right. fyi yeah well it's about time we get to our paperless society right we've been promising this for eons since the advent of the computer oh paperless um you know i used to say five or six years ago we print more today than we've ever have i actually think we're on the downhill side of printing i've convinced a lot of my colleagues to scan all their documents in and start you know take notes and keep them in the keep them on SharePoint or keep them, you know, somewhere in a shared repository, repository online. Christian, are you guys in school? Are you doing less on paper and more exercises and stuff on, on your um, iPads or laptops or whatever you have? Oh yeah. I mean, a lot of, uh, a lot of note taking has gone off physical notebooks and onto iPads. Um, and also a handful of teachers will use eBackpack to submit assignments digitally, uh, with a combination of using Turnitin for like mm. English essays and that kind of stuff. So, um, really topics like math and science, you won't use that as much, but if you're sitting in a history class, everyone has their iPads out taking notes. No one's writing it in a notebook anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I, I almost always open up um, notepad, not notepad, but the uh, the sticky note application in Windows 7. I pop that and just start taking notes right in those, and I've got a bunch of them you know, stuck around. And if I need it, I'll copy and paste it out and put that somewhere where I need it, or I just close it out, and it's disposable. So it's a pretty nice pretty nice methodology. We do, our enterprise blocks all of the, uh, most of the um, cloud services. So SkyDrive, Google Drive, uh, Evernote, Dropbox, Box, those. We, we, for security reasons, we lock those down. So in the enterprise, uh, Nathaniel, you'd mentioned, you know, I think that was you had mentioned, you know, a lot of students are wanting to use more, bring their own device and use it the way they want to use it. And they'll attach to the social or cloud services to use it. I think the enterprise is still a little weary of that for the most part. And for security, for data security reasons, they're locking those things down. So I'm interested if there's gonna be this weird digital divide between these college students who are graduating and are used to having everything in the cloud, then they move into the enterprise and they realize they may not be able to use all the cloud services. Now, the enterprise is replacing those with their own version of their cloud services where it's behind the firewall, so to speak, and it's protected, but. Well, yeah, you're right. Um, two points I was thinking is, yes, the kids are going to start going into jobs and saying, what do you mean I have to use my email? Like I just Facebook and text or whatever. So this email is an antiquated communication method for them. And we're trying to say, well, I understand you don't use that socially, but at work, this is a valuable tool for us. So you are practicing for work. But the, the cloud services and stuff, yeah, I bet they're going to balk at that depending on where they go. Um, I would, you know, sympathize with your, your company or business organization that's trying to reduce data leakage by closing those things. Um, and that makes a lot of sense to me. In our scenario, we have secure data, but we don't have the same security threat and we value um, learning and flexibility and this chance to grow uh, and use tools and experiment more than locking everything down. And so we keep Dropbox and SkyDrive and things like that open um, for personal accounts. The nice thing is you can, if you want that sort of ease of use and flexibility, you can, you can pay for it as an enterprise, whether you set it up yourself or pay for Dropbox for Teams or Evernote for Business or 
Uh, eBackpack's a paid service that works that way. Um, Mobile Echo by Group Logic is a very much Dropbox for Enterprise tool. Um, and, mm -hmm. and that would be one way to have your IT organization control the data. You know, you have access to this folder of documents for this amount of time, and then we pull it off your device. So there are tools to have a Dropbox cloud-like experience, but have IT control it, but it costs money. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, so we don't use anything that costs money. <laughs> right. Well, I, I just met uh, two weeks ago, I met with the enterprise guy from Box, box.com. Yeah. And they're, they are really pushing that model for organizations to, you know, oh, they even have Active Directory, you know, uh, integration where mm -hmm. you can port your Active Directory accounts in there and then have access to their cloud services and they secure them. And so it's, it gives you that Dropbox or, or, or box like functionality, but without, um, necessarily it's still kind of behind the corporate firewall so to speak so yeah and they have that control because that data is sensitive it's it's their business you know and they yeah. need to be able to remote wipe it or pull it off or and control it and it's it's kind of cool the way they can do that and the way they built those tools out but um, not, not at our level right now yeah okay Good, good, good to know. Well, guys, we're coming up on uh, on the end here. I've got some announcements to do, but anything else, uh, you know, Andrew and, and Christian, you guys will be back uh, next week to talk more laptops. Nathaniel, anything else yet you wanted to talk about from a laptop perspective while you were here? Did we cover it all? I think we're good. I, right. I mean, my message is just, you know, figure out your use case scenario and spend as little as possible. Yeah, there you go. Well, and I think we had a great conversation, very timely conversation around the, the Chromebook. And I'll be honest, I hadn't really thought, I looked at it at one time and I kind of went, eh, I don't know. Eh, you know. Yeah, I think we did an old show where we all just hated on it. <laughs> we might, we might <laughs> I have. I think I remember that. <laughs> well, and it's not a full laptop, so you have to kind of take that in account and know what you're getting when you go into it and um, use it for what it is. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I feel comfortable sending it with my kid to school because it's $250 and it's secure. So that, and that's a that's great, great point. And if the school has open Wi-Fi and they can make mm -hmm. it and, and it's okay that they have the, those devices in class, I think that's, a, I mean, I would even, I'd expect maybe one or maybe two years use out of it. And then it would be like, okay, it's time to replace it. Do those have spinners in them? The ones that you get? Are those? No, we only buy the SSD ones because we don't care about local storage. Right. And so occasionally when there's like 600 kids that have logged into it, it kind of fills up and you have to do a wipe again. I don't, I don't know if that's a bug or a feature. <laughs> okay. But, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> we don't care about local storage because they're shared. Now, if it was my personal one and I was using it for local storage, maybe I'd put um, like a USB or an SD card, but it's really not meant to store stuff locally. Sure. Sure. And I think those okay. SSD drives are pretty, go ahead, Andrew. I was going to say that that policy, um, iteration that we were talking about before is probably something that will address that in the future as well, right? So, you know, with any luck, it'll become like a Windows, Windows terminal server. So you, right. can, you can say to the, the environment, if this device hasn't been logged into for 70 days, then delete its profile or or something like that. But Yeah, clean it up automatically. You know, yeah, and I mean, that, that's the cloud model, isn't it? I mean, there shouldn't if there's no data on the device, why does it need a profile? Because effectively, you're only ever logging into your services online. True. Yeah, I kind of think True. of it as like a really thin cloud client. Yeah, okay. So yeah. it's sort of your Citrix model. And it would be easier, it'd probably be faster to get that client profile information locally than to always be checking the cloud for it. You know, So it does make sense to download some of the, I assume mm -hmm. it downloads some of those profile settings, yep. makes them local. Uh, and, and keep some of that information. And then there's some sync capabilities too, right? When you're online, when you're using Google Docs and you're online, if you go offline, it should it switches into offline mode and then saves those documents locally till you come back online and then it starts syncing up with the cloud when right. you're done. So it's that kind of storage that you would want to have access to as well. Yeah. yeah. All right. Very cool. Well, uh, I will, uh, I'll say one more thing on the Chromebook and Andrew, you were kind enough to post this out on the Facebook group. So facebook.com slash group slash the average guy. Um, how to key has a nice article. And actually I did it this morning uh, while I was, this is how fast you could do it with VirtualBox. So you have to have VirtualBox already installed, but um, we'll throw a link in the show notes about it um, as well, but how to run, run Chrome OS and VirtualBox and try it out. So if you have, uh, if you're just an enthusiast, and even if you're not, if you're even kind of a, 
average tech guy, you can probably go out, if you just Google VirtualBox, download that, install it. Very easy to do. It's kind of the poor man's virtualization, so to speak. It's free. You don't have to pay anything for that. You get that set up. Um, then the, uh, the instructions on this How To Geek article have you go out and download one of the already compiled ISOs for Chrome. It's, they call it vanilla. And um, you can install that in VirtualBox. And, and somebody, maybe Andrew, maybe you can grab that link and drop it in chat for folks too if they can take a peek at it. Um, I did that this morning. I had the VM up and running in literally in five minutes. It's just a, it's really about six or seven clicks and you are done. There's just a few things that you got to do to make it work, but you can have Chrome OS up and running in a virtual, uh, in virtual box on your desktop and give it a try. If, you, if you're interested in seeing what the Chrome OS looks like, uh, you can do that with VirtualBox, and that actually worked out very easy. We'll include that link in the show notes if you want to go out and take a peek at that. And I think that might even have been written by our own Brian uh, Brian Burgess. Let me let me take a peek at that article real quick. And it, oh, I hate how to geek because they never put the name of the guy who wrote the article in it in there. So, anyways, uh, we'll include that again. We'll include that in the show notes going forward if you want to give it a try. Okay, we talked about next week. Uh, more laptop chat next week. I've got John Stutzman. I've got Kevin Schoonover. I've got Paul Brarin coming on. Three guys. It'll be a busy show. And, and so Christian and Andrew, you guys can, uh, you'll, you'll get to sit back and pick these guys' brains. But there'll be a bunch of us to talk about more. And they all have a different set of experiences. So while tonight we focused on Chrome and the Lenovo side of the house, Next week, we'll have a whole different uh, approach to this, so you're not going to want to miss might, next week. might not be safe to have Paul and I on the show. It might be a Lenovo VHP thing, you know. <laughs> it, it could, It could indeed. And, of course, Paul is that road <laughs> wire. He's been all over and drug his equipment everywhere. And so, um, uh, Nathaniel, you mentioned the road wire scenario, right, where the Chromebook wouldn't work for a guy who's always on the road and needs connectivity no matter what. Um, although Paul carries a, and he'll talk about this next week, Paul carries a Wi-Fi hotspot with him just in his pocket, and uh, he is his own hotspot. So he could use a Chromebook and connect to via Wi-Fi that way, and that would work just fine. They'll be on the show, and we'll talk about that next week. Uh, also next week, next Tuesday, April 30th, if you're in the Omaha area, I've mentioned this, and I've got a post over at the Average Guy. TV big Drobo Callie Lewis event here in Omaha. I can't still can't believe Callie is coming to Omaha, and we're going to get a chance to hang out with her out at the Upstream Brewery, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, all the guys from Drobo will be out there. Callie Lewis will be out as well, a chance to meet her. And so, if you need some details on that, just go out to theaverageguy.tv and go through a couple links. It's it's down a ways now at this point, but if you have questions, send me an email. If you're going to come, podcast at theaverageguy.tv. Let me know. So I can look for you. I know of three guys already in the local Omaha area who are coming out to be a part of it. So that is next Tuesday. Sarah's coming. Right, we're going to take the kids. It's going to be a family event for the Collisons. And uh, we're looking forward to that happening as well. Um, the I, I think I posted this. I think it, let me let me double check real quick just to make sure I put it out there. Yeah. So uh, at the top of the show, we mentioned... Uh, no, I haven't posted it yet. I'll post it here shortly. At the top of the show, I mentioned that um, I did this live remote, and some folks have asked me what equipment I used, and I did a post. I just didn't post it yet, but I will have it posted by the time this is recorded. So go out to theaverageguy.tv slash gear, and uh, you can take a peek. It's, again, it's not if you're listening live, it's not out there right now, and I apologize for that, but theaverageguy.tv slash gear, and uh, you can take a peek at all the equipment that I used when I did the live remote. Nathaniel's using the ATR2100, which we just can't talk enough about if you're going to do any, even if you're not going to do podcasting, if you make Skype calls, if you're doing Google Hangouts, it's a great mic for that. I mean, Nathaniel, we got great audio from you tonight. Well, I hope so. I hope it sounds better on the playback later on. It's a little awkward. I'm not used to a mic sticking in my face. <laughs> yeah. I well, like the kinda, headset better. It's good. It's good. It's a great, $33 right now on Amazon. Yeah. We have a link over there at theaverageguy.tv if you if you do that, I'll remind you, if you're going to buy anything from Amazon, go out to theaverageguy.tv slash Amazon. We had a great month of April. Uh, many of you did that. And, of course, we roll those back into giveaways. And I've also been asking for giveaway ideas. What do you guys want to win? Send me an email, podcast at theaverageguy.tv. We've got some money in our Amazon account. We want to give something away. What do you want Jim, to win? Jim, yeah. Jim, come on, come on. We just finished talking about a show about the Google Chromebook, and you're <laughs> asking what you want to win. Come you on. Wanna, do you, I don't have enough to give away a Google Chromebook yet. We'd have to wait a little while. 
So we just need some more people to use the link. Yeah, there you go. Use the link and we'll give away a Google Chrome book. And, uh, and we're not too, we're not that far away from it. So maybe, uh, maybe that'll happen and we'll do that and get that done. If you want something other than the Google Chromebook, send me an email podcast at the average guy. TV. All right. One more thing out on the Facebook group. I asked the question, what are you listening to in a podcast? Mike Howard and I are going to get together. We want to put this video together that helps kind of the average guy navigate through the world of listening to podcasts. We're all good at that for the most part in our tech community. We all know how to do that, but guess what? The average guy doesn't have a clue. When I talk to the average person about listening to podcasts, eyes glaze like pop, pop, what podcasts. What are those? Uh, a lot of trends that I'm seeing now and a lot of the talk I'm seeing is that podcasting, while we all think it's big now, I think it's going to get bigger. And, uh, and of course, we want to help people uh, figure out with 1 billion Android devices in the world here by the end of 2013, we want to help folks figure out and how to listen to podcasts on their phone. Andrew's holding his up there as well. So if you jump over to Facebook, if you'd let me know, jump over to Facebook slash groups slash The Average Guy. And, uh, and join the group and let me know how you're consuming the podcast. That would always be nice. And we'll put a little tutorial together on that and, uh, and get that out. So that is what's coming up as well. All right. Hang around. If you're listening live, hang around for the pre-show or for the post-show. We did the pre-show earlier. The post-show on this side. Um, and uh, again, you only get what goes on in the post-show if you're coming around live. So you can join us live each Thursday night. 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern at TheAverageGuy.tv slash live. Great chat. I want to thank everybody who jumped out into chat tonight. We had a really good group, and I appreciate all the contributions you guys make in chat, and, and uh, so thanks for coming out this evening. And then I'll remind you, if you're not, uh, this is a little a little hint of what's coming on the video that we're gonna, Mike and I are going to make. If you're not listening to your podcast through Stitcher and you're struggling to get them every week, Stitcher's a great way to do it. It's available both for Android and iPhone platforms. Any browser you can think of, you can subscribe to Home Tech, and when a new one comes out, you can listen to it every single week uh, when it's available. You can listen to them in the car. It's a great way to get to and from work, listen to the podcast. We're a lot better than talk radio. So jump out, stitcher.com, download it for any just about any of the platforms. Create an account, search Home Tech, stitcher.com. It's radio for, or it's uh, education for your ears. And then, of course, lots of things to, to subscribe to. Go out to our YouTube channel. If you're listening to this on Stitcher, now this show, not a lot of visuals, so you're probably good to go. But some of our shows, we, we put things up on the screen, and you might want to see it. Head out to youtube.com slash TheAverageGuyTV. And, of course, you can catch us on Google Plus as well. Just search The Average Guy Podcast. All right, I think we're through it all. Gentlemen, thank you, Andrew. Good to see you again. Christian, great uh, having you like five days away from uh, oh, yes. from high school. And uh, Nathaniel, thanks for coming out tonight. It's always good to have you on and get your, uh, get your perspective on things. We enjoy that. Everybody in chat, thanks for coming out. You can stay around for the post show. We'll do some chit chat, but uh, this will wrap it up for the recorded conversation. Thanks for coming out and have a good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks.